So this podcast, like a lot of very good and very bad ideas, started with a happy hour. This one between me and our sound designer at 13 Media at Windstar Casino in Thackerville, Oklahoma. Before we had even started production on this series, she asked me how I would define the show's success. And honestly, I said that I would feel successful if 20 people listened to the show and felt like it had resonated with them somehow. I had a really hard time believing, though, that 20 people would listen. And I certainly didn't believe 20 people would listen past the first episode, especially if they weren't related to me. Much to my surprise, a lot more than 20 people listened. And new people continue to find us all of the time. It turns out that even though the Worldwide Church of God mostly seems like a piece of American religious history now, a lot of us still feel very impacted by it or see our own religious experiences reflected in these stories. I have gotten so many messages from people since we started the show saying how much it's helped to put their experience in the church in a social context that they didn't even know they wanted or needed. Some said that they felt like the show had been therapeutic, bringing up memories and feelings that they had long ago suppressed, only to realize after listening to the show that they hadn't actually worked through those experiences altogether. A lot of people also said that they just felt thankful that they now had something to share with their spouse or their children to help explain where they had come from because they didn't know how to fully explain the Worldwide Church of God to someone who hadn't lived it. And I have been so deeply humbled and grateful for these responses. And I can't thank you enough for giving us some of your time each week. But unfortunately, it's now time to bring this series to a close. So for the last time, I'm Trisha Jenkins, and this is Worldwide, the Unchosen Church. I know that there are probably a hundred thousand stories that could be told on this podcast, but the truth is that we only had time and resources to tell 10. And we tried in those 10 to give a variety of perspectives to show how people's race or sexual orientation or gender or profession or family history all intersected with their time in the Worldwide Church of God. And it's clear from each of these interviews that the church brought with it some very wonderful and also some very harrowing experiences. It's clear that many of us have what I would call hangovers or residue from their time in the Worldwide Church of God. For instance, Glenn Washington from episode three says that he still grapples with the church's idea that this earthly life was just a trial run and that the real life was eternal life, that life with Jesus that was just on the flip side of a nuclear holocaust. And that idea made it not just hard to plan for the future, but also to just really appreciate the present moment. I was told that I would never make it out of my teens. I remember being in a church in Midland and having someone say, and I, this is a quote, if you think we're going to make it through the 1980s without seeing the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, you got another thing coming. And that weight was really palatable. The idea that this is temporary, that all this is just ephemeral, the real deal is just about to happen, so that's where your focus has got to be. The idea that this is fake, that my life right now is preparatory for another life, it, it runs deep. And to try to get out of that mentality was really tough. I remember being at a holiday dinner with my kids. I was just so happy. Someone was clowning and singing and goofing and we're eating and drinking and whatever it was, kids and friends. And I remember like, oh, this is nice, but wait until later on when you really get to live life. And I remember trying to shut that off. It was like, you, this is it. This is the life. Stop doing this bifurcation thing that you grew up with. And 
And that, and I, I think that's a, that's a real struggle for a lot of us. Um, be here right now. Lisa Metzel from episode four also says that she still struggles to turn off some of the church's old conditioning. You know, if, if one of my kids were to get in a really bad car accident and have chronic pain from that, there would be a small part of my head that would say, is this my punishment for not being in the church? Joseph Dekach Jr. is still suffering some negative impacts as well, although his might look a little different from most of ours. Being that our church was premillennial, dispensational, always hawking prophecy, there were people who would think that they're one of the two witnesses uh, or a modern day prophet, and they would show up at my office or my house and have a message from the Lord. The last visit was about two years ago, and this was a couple who lives in Minnesota, and and they would drive straight through to my house in Southern California, ring the doorbell like 6, 7 a.m., and tell my wife they had a message from the Lord for me. The first time was I need to repent and keep the Sabbath and holy days, and then the second time was if I don't repent, Uh, My name is blocked out of the Book of Life. Others of us have suffered far more than an early morning knock on the door from some crazy Midwesterners. I don't know how common sexual abuse was in the church, but I know anecdotally it happened a lot more than you might think, with cases often being handled internally by the ministry rather than going through the legal system. To protect his identity, I'll simply call the next person H, who was raped by a church member in his teens. When his parents told the pastor, all that happened was that this man was asked to stop coming to church for a while, and eventually he was allowed to return. When I asked H why he thought nothing more had happened, this is what he had to say. Sexual abuse in the church? Probably that was the the way they typically handled it, which would be to just silence it and disregard it. The culture of the church is we never voted. We were to exist in the world, but not of the world. So we were essentially waiting for the time that would come after the apocalypse, once we've been protected and then we're rebuilding the world. Um, boy, that was, that was such a powerful delusion for people. So we did not participate in the government of man. We wouldn't have gone to the authorities to deal with something that was criminal and punishable by law. So I, I think that's just the way it was handled. There was no justice. My residue is less traumatic. For me, I still struggle to go to doctors. I tried to power through a case of walking pneumonia a few years ago for over four weeks before I'd go see anybody. The other piece of residue that I think I still carry around with me is that I sometimes struggle to make accommodations for other people. And it's because in the church we were so clearly different from other people But we never asked or expected society to change for us. We never asked sports teams to stop playing on Saturdays so that we could participate. We never asked teachers to stop holding Halloween parties at school because we couldn't partake. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I definitely think it made me a little tougher, which is something that Burnell Clifford echoed to me when I talked to him about growing up in the church in South Africa. I just think that if you are different, you have to find a way to integrate. It was on us to make it fashionable and cool and acceptable. You know, the world doesn't owe us anything, so it wasn't on our surroundings and people around us to to make those accommodations for us. We had to find a way to fit in. I'd like to think it made us more resilient, able to to deal with bullshit because we were exposed to it and we were ridiculed for it. And you kind of had to kind of have a thick skin. Going to school where like, Half the kids were Christian, apostolic, other half were Muslim. And then they asked you what you did. And you said, like, I, I kind of celebrate Jewish holidays. 
I'm kind of sort of Christian, but not because we don't celebrate Christmas and Easter. So you were weird. So it just made me a sort of more resilient and more not tolerant of taking BS, you know, and standing up for myself and pushing back against bullies. And that helped in relationships and work environment. And as Brunel echoes in that segment, the Worldwide Church of God was not all bad. I mean, if there were no joys in an experience, people would never stay with it, often for years or even decades. This is cult expert and former member of the Moonies cult, Dr. Stephen Hassan again. I wanted to talk about how important it is to, when exiting a cult, to think back over all the things you've actually learned, all the good things that you can mine from the experience. In other words, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you've heard that expression. For me in the Moonies, I learned how to public speak. I learned how to fast for seven days with just water. I never do it again, but I know I can. I uh, learned to live communally with people. Never had that experience other than camp. Uh, learn to eat sushi, uh, just to name a few things. But it's very important to not just put your experience in a closet and forget about it. Do the work and pull out all the good stuff. So I had wondered what, for our listeners, that good stuff was. And here's what you had to say. I'm Brian, and my best memory of the WCG is my mom and dad picking up my sister and I out of our beds at four in the morning and putting us in the back seat of a packed car for an early departure to one of the tabernacle sites. The feast was full of excitement, wearing clip-on ties, getting presents, meeting friends, and seeing thousands of like-minded attendees and the green stickers on their cars. The WCG even produced and screened its own entertaining music videos for the feast, complete with a lumbering bird-suited mascot called Big Beak. My name is Isaac, and besides meeting my wife at Ambassador College, the most positive experience has to have been the summer that I spent working in the canoeing department at SEP in Minnesota. It was by far the most formidable experience I had as far as growing up and understanding my strength, mental strength, emotional strength, and appreciation for the outdoors and friends. Hi, I'm Gina. The most valuable thing to come out of my experience was actually what occurred after the doctrinal changes that began in 1994. I was 17, and over the next few years, I witnessed the most incredible dissolution of an entire belief system and the religious organization as I had known it. And it set me on a path that really transformed me. I left the church and I learned to think for myself and become an authority for my own life rather than blindly following an ideology. And that experience has protected me from falling into other belief systems. And for that, I'm grateful. Hello, I'm Sandra Messier. I attended the Montreal Quebec Church until I was 16 years old. I realize today that having been part of the church is also a part of me. It is my story my history and I've learned to love every part of my past and that's the only way I'll be able to live a peaceful and enjoyable future. Hello, my name is Chris Daly and I grew up in the Worldwide Church of God in Southern California. My best memories are all the great times of my teenage years in YOU and the great true friends that I made. Still today, though many of us have left the Worldwide Church of God and or joined Splinters, I remain friends with many of them. They all hold a dear place in my heart. Hi, this is Stephen Fairchild. And one of the best things that I got from the Worldwide Church of God was a travel bug. Growing up, we went to a lot of international feast sites. So by the time I left the church in the mid 90s, I'd already been to about 20 countries. And since then, I've gone to about 50 more countries. I'm around 75 now. And I think that travel bug came from growing up in the Worldwide Church of God. Hi, I'm Sherry Hodges. And a great memory I have growing up in the Toronto WCG is going to Bass Lake every summer for the YES camping trip. 
this camp would bring together at least 50, sometimes 100 children, and a small group of our parents all volunteering their time to make this week a success. They did everything from planning menus, sourcing food and equipment on a budget, to running activities, and my favorite part, standing in the lake all day, teaching little eight-year-old me how to water ski. Hello, my name is Africa Afeni Mills, and from my time in the Worldwide Church of God, I truly valued the opportunity to spend time at the Denominations Camp in Minnesota and at Ambassador University, and for the friendships that I was able to begin and sustain there that even carry on to this day. Those are really important parts of my life. I think another thing, the uh, community part, we spent a lot of time with church people, but we also spent a lot of time outside of services, you know, sporting events, so volleyball, softball, basketball, and we're around each other a lot, and that turned into lifelong friendships that we wouldn't have otherwise had. I've talked to my kids about this sort of thing, and they've got college friends, they've got high school friends, and they're not really close to any of them. But I can see somebody that I haven't seen in years, and if we cross paths, it's like our conversation is continuing from just yesterday. And it's a closeness that, unfortunately, I think a lot of people will never have. Hi, I'm Bonnie. I grew up in the Worldwide Church of God, and when I really stop and think about it, I don't have any regrets. Having to be so strict about things molded me into the person I am and gave me character. I wouldn't have met my husband and have my children and the wonderful friends that I have. I literally have friends all over the country and even other parts of the world. I know if I were anywhere and needed help, there would be someone I could reach out to. That is the church community of friends we built. So as you can see, themes of community and relationships and friendships and social experiences are some of the most common and wonderful things to have come out of the WCG experience. I was also curious though, how people who listened to this podcast but had never been involved in the Worldwide Church of God, reacted to some of the things that they heard in the series. My name is Richard, and I'm Jewish. And one of my big takeaways from this podcast is the fact that WCG members took Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, and turned it from eating inside a temporary hut that you decorate with fruit, to staying at a luxury hotel for seven days and having a seven-day party. And to me, that's the cleverest thing that Herbert W. Armstrong came up with, turning Sukkot into uh, a basic Bacchanalian feast. So... I feel like I've learned there's no really one way to view the, the WCG experience. Like in any context, our life experience depends on the practices of the people who raise us and the context that we are placed in throughout our childhood. The people we meet, the people that form us. There's some unique ugliness in the pre-split WCG for sure. The blatant misogyny, the blatant racism, and all the grifting. But the WCG was just another way that individuals looked for meaning in life. It was just one more way of making meaning of life's joys and struggles. My name is Diane. Thank you so much to you and your guests for your honesty and willingness to be vulnerable. I wasn't raised in the WCG or in any type of doomsday religious cult, but I know people who were. From listening to your stories, I've gained more compassion. I appreciate the diversity of perspectives that were showcased, and I now understand more of the complexity and subtlety in this life force. Thank you for this expose. This is Lisa, the co-founder of igotout.org. The whole idea with hashtag I got out is to unify survivors' voices. One of the things that we've seen is that so many people who got out of specific groups might be able to find peer-to-peer -peer support with people that left their same group. And, you know, the truth is, is that most survivor stories, most coercive control situations actually look a lot alike. You know, like, 
I, my group was a kind of self-help therapy based new agey group. And yet I'm listening to your podcast and I hear so many of the same kinds of controls, the same kinds of harm that's done to people in, in that format. And when you can recognize or you can see that, you know, of course the Moonies are a cult, right? If you see that and then you realize that the same controls are happening inside your group, then you start to have this little break of sunlight that is the idea that perhaps you're in a group that is harmful. So the cross-pollination of experience happens through people's personal stories because it resonates. It hits you in your heart. I know that a lot of people would have liked to have shared their story on this series, but I'd like to remind you of the I Got Out hashtag movement and resource center that invites survivors of all kinds of high demand groups to tell their stories in order to support, educate, and heal others in similar situations. Lisa says that how each person's story gets shared is entirely up to them. You can have your story featured on their website, it can be shared on their Instagram page, you can choose to share it yourself with the hashtag I Got Out, and you can choose to include your name or to remain anonymous. She notes that their one policy is that they don't allow for specific groups to be named, partly to avoid litigation, but also because by not being specific, other people can more easily see their experiences in yours. So if you'd like to tell your story, we'd love for you to consider doing it through the I Got Out movement, which was co-founded by Lisa in consultation with Sarah Edmondson from A Little Bit Culty and the Nexium documentary, The Vow. Thank you so much to each of you for being a part of this series. We hope that through listening, you saw some of your own experiences reflected in some way. And I'd especially like to thank Jesse, Glenn, Heather, Dawn, Lisa, DJ, Kevin, Dave, Joe Jr., Lenisa, and even Bobby Fisher. Revealing yourself in a public forum is not always an easy thing to do. And I am incredibly grateful that each of you shared a part of yourself with us. My other two big thank yous go out to Professor Richard Allen, who listened to each episode and gave me a lot of great advice about how to structure this series, especially that pilot episode. The other one goes out to 13 Media, who really encouraged me to do this podcast and believed in this story even before I did. Without her help and her mentorship, this series would simply not exist. She's the one who took my boring audio files and turned them into something much more magical. And speaking of 13 Media, if you have young children, I'd love to encourage you to listen to her other podcast. It's called ABC Story Sisters, and it features three young sisters who bring classic children's literature to life for the littlest of podcast fans. As you probably know by now, Worldwide, The Unchosen Church is written, produced, and hosted by me, Trisha Jenkins. Music in this episode licensed by Soundstripe, and sound design and production by 13 Media. If you'd like to send us a comment, please reach out to us on social media at WorldwidePod on Instagram and WorldwidePod11 on Twitter and Facebook. You can also email us at WorldwidePod11 at gmail.com. And finally, if you enjoyed this series or think that maybe it saved you even 15 minutes with an expensive therapist, we'd love to ask for your support at buymeacoffee.com slash worldwide pod. You can tell us to either host it or toast it. Support labeled with a host it will go towards our hosting fees to make sure that this podcast can be available for years to come so that other people can continue to find us and that you can re-listen whenever you want. 
support labeled with a toast-it will absolutely go to buying margaritas so that we can toast what we hope was the end of a successful podcast series. Although there is no episode for next week, we sincerely hope that your year will be as royal and majestic as this hymn always made me feel. Worldwide, The Unchosen Church is also proud to support the hashtag I Got Out movement, which empowers survivors of cults and other high-demand groups to share their stories online as a catalyst for education, prevention, and healing. Learn how you can share your story and support other survivors at igotout.org.